Good morning. My name is Stephen Nolan, and I'm the Managing Director of the UNDP Financial Centres for Sustainability, a network of 39 financial centres, including Dublin, all working together on the area of ESG and sustainable finance. I'm also very proud to be the Chairman of this year's Climate Finance Week 2022, an output of the Irish Government's Ireland for Finance strategy. I'm live from the AIB studio here today, and we're now about to get into a panel focused on the whole area of climate finance for development within the emerging markets and the development world. The Irish government a few months ago came out with a new strategy in this space, and we'll unpack that a little bit in, the mo in, in a moment. But I'm delighted here in studio today. I'm joined by Dr. Paul Ryan, uh, the Department of Finance, David Carlin with the UN, and Mike Hayes, a partner and a global lead on decarbonisation with KPMG. Virtually, we've got Valerie in DC. It's very early there, Valerie, Washington, DC. Great to see you. And then we have Noel in Manila in the Philippines with the Asian Development Bank and it's late there so we're really stretching across the world today for Climate Finance Week. Thank you both for joining us. So I'm just going to kick off, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. So first I'm going to start with you Valerie if I may, would you just mind taking a moment and tell us who you are and who you work for please Valerie. Good morning, good afternoon everybody in Dublin and good evening Noel. I'm Valerie Hickey, I'm the Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources and the Blue Economy at the World Bank based in Washington DC, but a very proud Cork woman. You know, I don't know what it is, but all roads lead back to Cork. I've got a very proud Cork man here beside me as well. Uh, actually got two very proud Cork men beside me now, I think about it, I was insulted one of them for a moment, uh, but all roads lead back to Cork. Noel, you're in Manila. Uh, please don't tell me you're from Cork as well, uh, but perhaps you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well. Yeah, hi, good, good evening from um, morning to Dublin. Uh, so my name is Noelle O'Brien and uh, care in Tipperary is home for me. So lots of uh, um, the Asian Bank, I'm the Director of Change and Disaster Management. Happy to be with you today. Great, thank you, Noel. I know I can, I can hear we already have maybe an issue with your, your Wi-Fi, but I'll let the guys in the background try and fix that out, uh, fix that as we, as we pivot to the rest of the group. I'll start on the far side. David, with the UN, do you mind taking a moment and introducing yourself? Yeah, um, thanks, Stephen. So great to be here. I'm David Carlin. I am the Climate Risk and TCFD Lead for the UN Environment Programs Finance Initiative, or UNFFI. Paul. Thanks, Evan. I'm, I'm Paul Ryan. I work in the Irish uh, Finance Ministry. I head up its International Finance and Climate Division that covers all the MDBs and uh, climate, both domestic and international, and that includes sustainable finance as well, Stephen. Mike, please. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever people are. My name is Mike Hayes. I lead up KPMG's global climate change and decarbonisation business, working with corporates and public sector all over the world on their net zero journey with a very specific focus on the innovation agenda and the agenda of mobilizing capital for developing countries. I have a secondary role as well, which is very much uh, related to my climate role, which is that I head up our global renewable energy business. So delighted to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Valerie, Noel, David, Paul, and Mike. Paul, if we can maybe pick on you first to get us going, you're just back from the IMF World Bank meetings. Uh, we had Deputy Governor uh, Sharon Donnery on this morning was good enough to join us and she was there also as part of your delegation uh, and Minister Donoghue and else. And we saw a lot in the media about the whole area, not just climate but Ukraine, the war there, mm -hmm. energy crisis, debt crisis, cost of living crisis and so on and so forth. And then we heard Kristalina, uh, the President of the IMF, in, in a piece, if we don't get our act together by 2030 we're literally going to be cooked. Here yesterday Colin Hunt spoke uh, on a panel with yourself as well, that 2030 is literally just... Mm -hmm. A, a blip away, especially, and Mike will talk about this later on, when we're talking about infrastructure and the process we need to go and get planning, raise capital and actually build the infrastructure from climate resilient perspective by the time you get there. What were your key takeaways, if you don't mind, uh, for the audience on last week's sessions in DC, please? Okay, Stephen, so look, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, the, the key message across the IMF World Bank, and there was also meetings on G7, G20, um, the Finance Minister's Climate Coalition, that at the moment we obviously have a clear, a clear crisis uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, energy security, security crisis, a cost crisis, heating economies worldwide. But despite that, we need to focus on climate action. 
and this is the way to actually deal with this crisis. Uh, there was a clear call across all of the engagements by, by the finance ministers and indeed the head of the IMF and the World Bank that we need to double our efforts uh, to focus on, first of all, transition to, a low, to low carbon economies and also then to speed up, the, obviously, the, the work done towards um, net zero by 2050. And um, that this is to be done using a clear enabler of sustainable finance and also then uh, a call for basically a public-private partnership. Governments and state entities working very closely and successfully as they have in the past with the private sector. So that whole, you know, one of the key messages came out was public-private mm -hmm. uh, and in the sense of how can we crowd in private capital as well in, in, in this agenda. Valerie, if, if, sorry, Noel, if I may turn to you, I know you had a very long flight back from DC to Manila. <coughs> I think you only got in yesterday morning. Um, can you, in, in the sense of what you're seeing and what you're seeing in, in, in the region, but also your perspective on your key takeaways from last week's meetings and how does that impact on the work that you do in the Asian region, please, uh, Noel. So uh, thanks, Mike. I mean, from our perspective, um, you know, we're, we're Pakistan is obviously what. Okay. Well, we have a pause there on Noel. Valerie, I'm going to move to you next, if you don't mind. You're obviously based in DC. You work in the World Bank in DC. You were part of those discussions last week. In terms of your global role, how do those discussions impact on what you do, please, going forward? So I think what was interesting, what we heard, and it's exactly what Paul was saying, Stephen, is that sooner or later, please God, sooner, the war in Ukraine is going to end. We can restructure debt because one of the big discussions this week, of course, was, was the, the unsustainable debt crisis that is emerging, coupled with the end of the, the, end of the era of cheap capital and financial sector um, tightening. Forgive me, it's early here, so I'm still a little bit inarticulate. Um, with the end of the war in Ukraine, inflation is going to come down, food security and food prices should get better, but we can't restructure our way out of climate change, nor can we restructure our way out of biodiversity loss. And this idea of thinking about global public goods and global public bads, and how do we as an institution at the World Bank ready ourselves to provide more finance to exactly where it's needed. Last fiscal year, so our year ending in, in June 30th, we invested as the World Bank Group almost $32 billion in climate change and climate finance, 40% of which went to Africa, half of which was for adaptation. But that's not enough. It's certainly not enough from us, but it's certainly not enough for everybody else. We're talking about less than 10% of climate finance is going to adaptation in a world where, as Noel was just starting to say, one third of Pakistan was underwater just three weeks ago. We're seeing southern Madagascar hungry because of climate change. We're seeing some of the worst droughts in the Horn of Africa that we haven't seen since the 1980s, leading to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on the brink of famine. So we're in a world where right now we have to continue talking about how do we mobilize finance for decarbonization, and particularly, how do we get private capital to step up in that space? But also, how do we get more money for adaptation and resilience? Because it's harder to get private capital in here. So how do we use the limited overseas development assistance, ODA, and World Bank budgets, and all the budgets of the ADB and other multilateral development bank to make sure that we don't forget the most among us and the most vulnerable, including the small island developing states, who simply don't have their own financial capital to do enough and for which private capital isn't rushing in, particularly at the moment, when private capital, in fact, we're seeing flying out of emerging economies because they're putting more emphasis on this predictability premium, on wanting to make sure that as risks go up, the rewards do too. And in emerging economies, it's simply risks that are increasing at the moment. Great. Thank you very much for that, Valerie. And, and Mike, I will go back to Noel, but in a moment, I will come back to you. That's a great statement. Can't restructure our way out of climate change and biodiversity. I'll come back to that in a moment. Noel, I hope you can hear me now. Uh, the question I was asking you earlier on was in the, in the context of last week's meetings and what happened in Washington, D.C., and what you're doing in the Asian region, what, what impact are those discussions having on your work, please, in the region? So I, mean, I think as, as Valerie has already indicated here, I mean, it's just becoming more and more challenging for the countries, uh, obviously, uh, to decide to borrow for climate uh, investments. But um, so we're, we're continuing to focus uh, with our member countries 
we're doing a lot more work on uh, the nationally determined contributions, more work on long term. Uh, we're doing a lot more diagnostic work to inform our country partnership strategies with the intention of shifting ADB's pipeline so that there is a greater climate focus within the, the mainstream investments that our governments are, are willing to take on. So that means greater um, use of our resources, uh, our grant financing, but also trying to figure out ways where we can have greater concessionality. Um, and that's obviously a discussion area that we are that's ongoing and obviously also in, in involving our governors and um, the, 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 the likes of the conversations that need to take place with Paul and all the other governors. And Noel, what, what is the quantum between now and 2030 that ADB is trying to put against your work in climate, please? So we've set out an ambition of $100 billion uh, between the period 2019 and 2030. And now just in terms of putting ADB within the context of other MDBs, uh, our annual portfolio prior to COVID was in uh, tw 20 billion per year. And last year we committed to 22 billion. So looking at uh, an ambition of 100 billion of climate finance, uh, if we're averaging uh, 5 billion climate finance at the moment, we need to increase that. So it almost makes up 100% of our portfolio uh, by 2026. Um, we've also committed to full Paris alignment for our sovereign investments by uh, next year, July 2023, and our non so 85% of our non sovereign investments also, um, and to have full uh, Paris alignment by 2025. So that will give you scale of the kind of commitments that we're involved in. Uh, for sectors for us, that's energy, transport, the traditional sectors of ur um, water, sanitation, urban um, agriculture, but also expanding our, our focus into areas around social protection and education and health also as part of that. Great, thank you, Noel. David, I want to go to you with the UN perspective. You don't deploy capital, but you are helping the systems in the emerging market developing countries, those systems be developed. Can you just give a sense of the type of work that you're doing and the impact it's having on the ground, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think in some ways the work that we do is a bit unique in bringing together uh, the public and the private sector with the UN. So a lot of the work that, that we've been focused on over the past few years has been how to move the financial system sustainably toward a stable and resilient future that is going to support net zero ambition, that is going to be aware of climate risks, that is going to provide financing for the green transition and adaptation. What that means in practice is for a number of different countries that we've worked with, including um, in Kenya, working first with supervisors as well as with, um, with those private institutions. A good example there, working with the central bank on their recently uh, released guidance on climate risk disclosure, and then doing a sensitization program with the bankers association there. We're likewise um, engaged through um, a number of partnerships in Vietnam, as well as in Latin America, developing a community of practice there with supervisors. And we really see this as a powerful combination, both ensuring that supervisors learn from the global practice, that's <coughs> the great work that groups like the Network on Greening the Financial System has been doing, taking that great work and bringing it to a local context. And very mm -hmm. similar to what's been said before, and I think Valerie's point was really well taken, Adaptation is absolutely critical. One of the questions that comes up time and again is we keep hearing about net zero, we keep hearing about decarbonization, but isn't that something that's going on in, in Europe, in North America? And the answer is it needs to happen everywhere, but we also need to be aware that climate adaptation isn't a future challenge, it's a current challenge. And the fact is, while we have a race to zero within the UN, we also have a race to resilience. And so how can private financial institutions unlock the financing necessary to build resilient infrastructure to protect people, lives and livelihoods today. Part of the work that we're doing is looking at the tools that people need to assess the physical risks as they exist, to understand their role in the transition, and to know that your role isn't simply making sure your institution is protected, but considering the community in which you operate and considering the role that you have as a larger stakeholder in the financial ecosystem. Thank you for that, David. Mike. 
I'm going to land a lot on your shoulders now. And I hope you have what, all the solutions. What, what, what's new? <laughs> right. <laughs> but you are from Cork, so we, we can take that, right? I did the kidney. I just, you know, we had our, our, our mutual friend, Sean Kidney, here yesterday. And he was good enough to accept one of our annual awards. Uh, and Sean has, as the CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative, was making a point, to both myself and Paul, actually, that 70% of future capital needs uh, around this agenda need to be deployed in the emerging and developed economies, right? Which just blew me away. I didn't realise it was that, that large. We've heard Valerie talk about, you know, that can't restructure our way out of climate change and biodiversity. We've heard Noel talk about 100 billion, which is so significant. However, it's trillions. And so the private sector needs to be brought in uh, alongside that. We've heard Paul talk away some of the key takeaways that this, this, this openness and this willingness and this urgent need to work the private sector again uh, back to deploy more capital. And then what David was saying, I could see you nodding your head, but really resonated with you about you know, the adaptation and so on and so forth. With your global role, and obviously the decarbonisation, but also in your renewable space, what are you seeing right now out in the market? And what are the challenges you're seeing in terms of some of the points we're seeing here today, crowding into private capital, please, Mike. So I'm going to try as best I can without any preparation to unpack a lot of that and pick up lots of brilliant points and really where to begin, where to end. I want to go back, there was references to 2050 and 2030. Where I am, forget that. Yeah. I, think, I think it was um, Valerie or Noel spoke about the, the crisis we're seeing in um, Noel in, in, or in the Pakistan and we're seeing in other parts of the world. The crisis is upon us today. And for me, the single biggest challenge is really to get people to think of it not as a future crisis, to think of it as a crisis today. That, all other solutions would become much easier if people embrace this. In the same way, and I always make this comparison to COVID-19, when COVID-19 happened and we saw, and this terrible analogy, we saw the dead bodies on the streets in Italy and Spain, suddenly we said, hang on, this is serious. We should be thinking like this on climate. And I still say we're not yet at that level, Stephen. Number first point. But for me, it's very much today. The second thing, and we've got COP27 coming up in a couple of weeks in Charmel Sheikh, and I think most of us will be, will be at that conference. Lots of issues about whether, how this conference is going to work. But behind the scenes, for me, the thing that has happened, mo that's most significant that has happened over the last 12 months, is we're now really talking about action rather than commitments. I'll be blunt, I'm sick and tired of commitments, you know, and everybody has commitments, but they're, they're meaningless. And one of the really positive developments has been the UK government have introduced this concept of climate transition plans and the GFANS initiative, which is a really important initiative, and I know there's some noise with some US banks, this initiative is very real and is going to have an impact. They are also bringing in the concept of tr transition plans. And I'm going to look at this, first of all, through a, a decarbonisation lens, and I do very definitely want to come back to what you were saying, David, on adaptation. But first of all, what I like about transition plans, it's going to hold people to account. Mm -hmm. In other words, making commitments is great, but unless you can demonstrate the type of meaningful action you're taking, then, then we're, we're, we're going nowhere. So that, for me, has been a big positive on the agenda. Um, I, I, and I think this is where you were going, David. Decarbonisation is very much a, we a Western developed country concept. And I know, and I've spoken to some incredible colleagues, particularly in the African subcontinent, they do not want to talk about decarbonisation. They don't even like the use of the word. Um, and that's why adaptation and resilience, if anything, is a much, much bigger issue. But so we have that perspective in the developing world. We have the decarbonisation challenges in the developed world. I keep saying to everybody, Yes, we've got lots of challenges. Nobody, nobody said this was simple. At the root of all of this is the funding. And, I, and you've heard me say this, Stephen, over the last 10 years. You know, if we can get the capital working and get the capital moving in the directions we want it to work, that's what's going to really make a difference. Yes, we're trying to develop new technologies and new solutions. That needs capital. We're trying to enable projects, particularly I'm very focused on the energy access issue. It is crazy today that we've one billion people in the world without access to electricity. I mean, I know we're in Europe, we're obsessed with high energy prices, but at least we've got energy. You know, we, the, the sheer amount of problems that that causes is just, you know, it's just not acceptable for, for somebody like me, particularly when, when I, I heard it in some of the other sessions during Climate Finance Week, there is so much capital available. So for me, ca capital, and this is where I'm coming back to Climate Finance Week, um, Stephen, capital and getting capital to work is incredibly important, but it's not simple. And um, I think some of the speakers on this panel have already commented on the, the unfortunate 
outflow of private capital away from emerging markets into, into um, the developed markets. And that is a, a very, very concerning statement if that, if that isn't in the case. And there are challenges. Now, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and you're probably going to stop me talking now in, in a couple of minutes, but I just want to make a couple of observations. So the, this issue about getting capital to work where we most need it in developing countries is fundamental, whether it's an adaptation perspective or a decarbonisation perspective. I want to make a couple of comments. First of all, uh, it's nice to say words, and I say to myself, about public and private sector collaboration. Mm -hmm. One of my biggest concerns is that, A, there's not enough collaboration, and B, and I, I say this looking at the private sector as much as the public sector, we speak a different language. I've been in so many sessions where when I've listened to the type of dialogue from public sector um, colleagues, and I work, I'm fortunate to work with incredible colleagues in the UN and in, in WEF and many other organizations, and I really want to work with them, their even use of language is quite different to the private sector and the way they, they look at it and the way they, they approach this. So that, that, that is a problem for me. The second thing I want to say is around risk. Ultimately, yeah. the capital would flow into where we wanted to in the emerging markets if it wasn't for risk but there's a difference between perceived risk and real risk. And certainly dealing with some, some people that I work with in projects in, in Africa, they get really frustrated about the lack of understanding about the reality of some of these risks. And when I spoke earlier about innovation, innovation is not just about technology. We need to innovate to figure out ways to solve, for, to make it more easier and simpler for capital to move into, in, into, these, um, in, into these locations. So I'll, I'll pause there, Stephen, but the, you know, we're, we are in a battle today. It's today, it's not 10 years time, and we have to stop thinking we've got time. We, we no longer have time. Mm -hmm. And for me, the secret sauce is always about cap. But pe people use the word sustainable finance, fine. For me, it's finance. You know, okay. it, it, all, all capital should be sustainable from now on. Paul, I'm going to come to you in a moment just to talk about it. I want to bring this down to the Irish level in terms of the government strategy. But if I may go to Valerie and Noel in terms of their perspective. Valerie, just in terms of what you've heard from Mike there, do you have any, any comments coming, coming back there in terms of the work that you're doing and, and some of the issues that you're seeing at play in what is a global portfolio, right? No, I mean, I agree 100% with everything Mike was saying, including the fact that I, I'm sick and tired of hearing about this being a problem for our grandchildren. It's a problem for our current grandparents. I mean, and, and we have to start talking about this as a future problem. But to me, the issue of finance, one of the conversations we don't have enough is about domestic resource mobilization. That's why I'm delighted you're going to be talking to Paul in a minute about what Ireland is doing. Because one of the conversations we never have is that most financing for climate at the end of the day is going to come from domestic governments within their own countries. It's not going to come from overseas development assistance or from the World Bank or the ADB. There simply isn't enough or a drop in the bucket. And it's not going to come necessarily from private capital, especially, let's be honest, in those sort of least developed countries where risk is higher. Yes, there's a difference between perceived risk and real risk, Mike, but particularly in spaces outside of energy and even within energy because of the state of utilities in many countries, there is very real risk and there's very real governance risk. There's very real operational implementation risk and we, we can't pretend it's not there. But one of the things I'll say that we need to, to really think about and something we spend a lot of time at the World Bank is how do we defragment the financial architecture? How do we think about making sure that we're not simply financing green projects and continuing this boom and bust of climate finance, where we invest in something, we have some good results, but because that investment doesn't go anywhere, because we've provided some finance for the capital expenditure, but not for the operations and maintenance of that infrastructure, the results erode quickly over time. We're wasting too much money. So we're looking to see how do we deploy grant financing where it is to do the policy reforms, to do the institutional strengthening you need that governments won't borrow for and that will help unlock their own finances, including will help repurpose subsidies, which is a difficult issue. Nobody wants to have it. And it's fundamental around climate change. It's a source of climate finance we need to tap. Mm -hmm. We also need to deploy our grant financing in order to build a pipeline of bankable but investable ideas, because often where there is interested capital, it can't find projects in emerging economies and developing economies to invest in. Then we really have to use our, the kind of loan capital that ADB and the World Bank has to provide the capital expenditure that really helps build the infrastructure, 
do the big change, help people transition for, to a low carbon economy, do the both the human and the physical capital infrastructure that is needed to do that. And then tap into the domestic public resources I was talking about to, to pay for the operations and maintenance. And once we have the policy reform, the private capital will come in because private capital at the end of the day, as Mike was saying, it's about risk. And they want to know the rules of the game. They want predictability. And that means policy reform, which isn't necessarily expensive, but it's lengthy and it's tough. We need to be spending a lot of our particularly very highly concessional finance helping countries do policy reform. They won't borrow for it. They won't do it unless they do it with partners, particularly with development partners who can take some of the blame for some hard decisions that need to be made. And so helping to defragment landscape. So grant financing can hand over to loan finance that can set the stage for repurposing domestic finance that in turn can create the predictability that attracts private capital. It's moving from just having separate parallel finance into really thinking about climate finance as a, as a relay race where the baton has to keep handing over from one to the other. Thank you, for Valerie. And I like, uh, I'm writing down all your phrases, the latest every relay race. I really like that, so thank you for that. Do you know what, Noel? That's a good way, maybe if I can bring a question to yourself now, uh, what Valerie was saying about the domestic and about the policy reforms, because as you said, it's not just about capital. It's more so, in some countries, just the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Climate Action, if there is one, actually talking to one another, right? And those systems that are in place. So, Noel, what are you doing in the ADB in terms of supporting the systems, maybe the policy reforms around this agenda, please? So a couple of things, Mike, and let me just say, I mean, all, uh, Valerie has addressed um, just the very similar story to what we're uh, involved with at ADB, uh, but just maybe some more specifics as to what it looks like um, in reality on the ground. So as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot more engagement on, with countries to translate nationally determined contributions into investment pipelines. We're bringing together ministries of uh, finance, planning, the climate agencies, and also with sector agencies in that work to translate their uh, ambition into actually investable pipelines. And those are pipelines that can be investments for ADB, the other MDBs, or also uh, governments themselves and bilaterals. Um, to give you one example, which we're working with eight of the member countries right now, which is translating the agriculture and water sections of the national adaptation plans into investment pipelines. So we're also doing a lot of work to strengthen the climate diagnostics. And this is with a particular focus on existing policy instruments, existing policy areas that support low carbon agendas, but also that support adaptation. And we think this is critical uh, to inform a policy investments. So ADB this year, we uh, processed our first policy, climate change policy-based loan for the Philippines. Uh, this has a uh, focus at the uh, institutional level for climate change, also at, in relation to long-term strategy to support, but then also with particular instruments that are in the energy sector, the transport sector, and agriculture. Now, for us, this question of where is the interconnectedness between uh, the, the non-sovereign uh, private sector and, and the sovereign agenda we see this policy influence as a critical uh, step to uh, create the enabling environment for a lot of our private investment to identify areas where uh, private sector can have particular uh, growth in whether it be um, in in the energy sector whether it be in the agriculture sector but but we see that the, the support for the private sector is required in this way. So, and again, as Valerie has mentioned, this requires us to use our grant resources uh, to be to to support this kind of work. Great, thank you, Noel. And you, I think that would be fascinating perspectives from both our colleagues in DC and Manila, and it just sounds great even saying it. Here we are, Dublin in the middle, right? Uh, Paul, can we, with the time we have left, can we bring it down to Ireland? because yourself and several departments with government came out with a strategy during the summer, 
Ireland has done a lot of climate finance in previous years, but what is the new strategy and what is it trying to achieve, please? Yes, even um, we brought out an international climate finance strategy. The government uh, cleared it in July and the minister actually launched it in the IMF and World Bank meetings last week. And so this basically takes stock of what we're doing to date and then looking to the future. We have a commitment of 225 million mm -hmm. per annum up to 2025. Now, this is, you know, it might sound low in, 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 in some cases compared to what Noel said for the EDB, but it's very much sort of a, a very starting point. But the key thing is basically looking at, you know, what are we doing at the moment and then who are we, who are we working with on what channels? I suppose the key thing out of this is to move from the traditional sort of grants and bilateral aid, moving into the UN, working with MDBs, and then obviously then working with the private sector. I won't mention public-private partnerships, but I, I, I think Mike knows what I mean. But it, it's a call basically to use innovative ways of working for the future. And that would move, mean more blended finance, as I said, working with the NDBs, working with the private sector, at the Asian Development Bank that Noel is fully aware of, we have a single donor trust fund, it's looking at climate, but it's looking at adaptation and resilience and risk management, which is the key thing for the future there. And to get this move from mitigation into the more practical areas of adaptation and resilience as well. And to get us involved with more sort of uh, international funds like that, that could be uh, philanthropic funds or as private sector funds, or else actually working with other countries as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a new way of working and looking at the future. Mike, last year we were good enough to join me here for just a one-on-one -on -one session. And, you know, we spoke about the journey you and I have been on for a while here in Ireland from green finance to sustainable finance. Uh, you've been fortunate enough to keep your hair. I've lost mine during that period. Um, but all joking aside, we kind of spoke about this cluster that has grown up in Ireland in the last decade or so around new, renewable energy expertise. And you've been very much supporting that, that, that cluster and its growth. And it now operates all over the world. And that's just one element just to kind of just bring that back into your mind because I, I wouldn't mind getting your thoughts where that cluster is now but and in the context of what we're discussing today listen to Paul there just that's that's one billion euro over the next four years of Irish government money flowing in through our program to to kind of support what Paul was, was going through if you think back where where we got to in the ESG agenda and how long it took us to get there where will we be right now on the climate finance development uh, agenda here in Ireland and if you look at that one billion, is there possibilities to add to that in the coming years? Or should we be looking at it and saying, well, that's four years. We've now got four years to get Irish industry ready for this next wave. Back to, that would be a 15 year period then of you and I, not saying we're both be in it, but uh, of working on this topic. Did you see where I'm coming from there, Mike? Yeah, so a couple of comments, Stephen. And first of all, I, I will congratulate the Irish government. I mean, this commitment to the agenda, this initiative is fantastic. And um, I've, as you know, you, Paul, myself have met. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. So I'm going to just build it up again with a couple of points. You spoke about the success that Ireland has had on the global stage in renewable energy. I'm incredibly proud of what Irish companies have done. And we keep hearing bad news these days, but it's a really good news story that Irish companies have developed projects all over the world. And we've punched to use that old cliche, way, way above our weight. We are many, many divisions ahead of where we should be, really. But um, it, for me, it was what originally informed my own thinking about the contribution Ireland could play onto the broader climate agenda. And so I think today, you know, we might forget about renewable energy, but you know, the, the terrible, terrible crisis in Ukraine has brought the issue of energy security and the need for low carbon energy sources home to us. I think Ursula van der Leyen and the EU Commission has done a fantastic job of matching the geopolitical energy agenda to the, to the low carbon agenda. So one of the biggest things that we're going to do globally to fight climate change is to continue to scale renewable energy, but many, many times quicker. Mm. And that is an advantage for Irish companies, but it's also an opportunity to be part of this. And one of the for me, one of the most significant things that's going to happen is real efforts are underway now to reduce development timeline. So that, that for me, is a good story in itself. Um, we have to think, and we have a job of work to do, to think about where should Ireland place its bets and where can it contribute to. But I'm going to go back. I, I actually was listening to all the panellists very carefully, and I got back to something that, um, that Valerie said about blue economy. The blue economy is one of the areas, uh, for me, it's a bit of a pet project and something that I think... Um, is going to be very important, whether it's in the area of carbon sequestration, whether it's in the area of sort of um, nature-based solutions, you know, for new, new types of animal feed. The bottom line is the blue economy represents huge, huge opportunity. 
And guess what? A bit like renewable energy, probably I think we had some natural skills. Ireland is as well placed as any company globally to be at the center of the blue economy. And we have incredible companies. We have companies here in Ireland, I'm going to mention one, Simply Blue Energy, which mm -hmm. is doing incredible work. They're a renewable company that said, we're, we're not just a renewable company, we're a blue economy company. And they are trying to you know, spend money on research and development, trying to think about how do you, how do you capture carbon at sea? How do, you, how do you grow seaweed and kiln to, to produce other low carbon results? And I would love to see Ireland take the lead globally with the help of, of the government mm -hmm. initiative to, to, you know, sometimes it's about leading and showing other companies the way. And I think when it comes to using our natural resources and our natural development mindset, which we have as a nation, matching that with, with, with the fact that we have got, you know, we might be a small country. When you think about it from a blue economy perspective, we're an absolutely huge country. Mm. So I'd love this initiative being spearheaded by the Irish government to, to do this. And for me, and I said at the very start, innovation, innovation, innovation. Innovation in all of its forms is really important. And again, I think as a, you know, maybe I'm sitting here as a proud Irishman, but we, we are bloody good at innovation, you know, and we've proven that in the digital sector, we've proven it in, you know, in financial services, you know, let's not forget the success of the IFSC. So I would love Ireland to become much more focused on becoming an innovation hub. And Paul, you and I have discussed mm -hmm. this. I have this vision that Ireland, it's not so much that we have you know, a, a part of Cork or a part of Galway that's, that's innovation. I would like to see Ireland Inc. itself becoming an innovation centre for the low carbon agenda. And you might think that's, that's very cheesy, but, but we have to think big and we have to think, think differently. So I think this commitment by the Irish government matched with what we've shown already that we can do, Stephen, we can, we, we can you know, we can do some quite incredible things on the climate agenda. And I don't want to sound self-serving, but climate is about opportunity as well. And from the private sector, if we're, if we're serious about getting the private sector involved, we need, to, we need them to think about this as an opportunity for them. The more they, the private sector thinks that way, the more they'll invest and the more they'll get involved. So my message is, let's, you know, let's really think about how we can build on the Irish government policy to produce results that are good for Ireland and good for the global um, climate agenda. Great, thank you, Mike. And if, if I may just go back to that one, Valerie, uh, I'm going to pick on you now because Mike mentioned blue economy and blue economy very much within your portfolio. We're in the context of what, because Mike, Mike there's just two elements going on in here right now. There's, there's an Ireland Inc. competitiveness as a, as a country, mm -hmm. but then going back to what Paul has talked about in terms of the development agenda, you know, is there perhaps a way to marry those two as they emerge? I don't know. Uh, but just interested in your thoughts about Ireland's blue economy in the scope of your work, pivoting back to Paul's strategy or the government strategy uh, in climate finance, uh, please. So Stephen, they already are married. I have to say the power of demonstration hmm. that Ireland Inc. already is globally in the blue economy is enormous. We've been using Ireland as an example in the past decade to show the fact that investing in the blue economy is exactly where you can integrate development, climate and nature in a way we, where you can reach the triple bottom line. And we use Ireland as a demonstration case because during the financial crisis, the Irish Marine Institute was actually growing, still growing its budget because Ireland saw that given that only 10% of its entire area was land and 90% is sea, you can't simply develop with your back to the sea. And Ireland's entire development path is something that many countries look to as being achievable. We haven't always been a high income country. Within our lifetime, many of us around the table today have been part of a, a, an Ireland where there was high unemployment, where there was low development scores, where there was high emigration. So a lot of countries that we work in, particularly small island developing states, also low income coastal countries look to Ireland as an example of a development pathway that you can take and how Ireland has turned around and no longer grows with its back towards the ocean has an incredibly full demonstration effect of how thinking about marine and coastal assets can suddenly unlock an entire source of wealth countries didn't even realize they had. But it's not just the demonstration effect. Ireland has been incredibly generous at contributing through the World Bank, but also bilaterally to many small island developing states. We have a program, for example, in the Eastern Caribbean, 
we're we're investing grant financing including grant finance like financing contributed through ireland to do a few things one we've helped create a new insurance product it's a parametric insurance product that's tied to climate change so that the small scale fishers in the eastern caribbean who are some of the poorest people in those countries don't lose out when the winds are too high and so they can't go out fishing it's a threat to life and, and safety they can stay at home and still get paid through this insurance product and it's thanks to the generosity of the irish people and the irish government that we've been able to help design and operationalize that product we're also putting money in again using the grant financing from the irish government to finance a project called unlocking the blue economy in the eastern caribbean where we're working with regional entities with governments so that they can do the policy reform that's necessary, build institutions that are strong, that can operationalize a blue economy strategy, but also build the infrastructure, the types of renewable energy infrastructure, the types of nature-based services that Mike, nature-based solutions that Mike was talking about. The idea of growing seaweed, which is one of the least talked about carbon sinks that can grow 60 foot in three months. Think about the carbon sequestration that can do and think about the food and nutrition and fish feed that it can also provide. Again, that idea that Ireland is showing and investing in in small island developing states, that the blue economy is a place you can really integrate development dividends so you can deliver jobs, you can grow economies, but also is good for climate and also is good for nature. Thank you, Valerie. No, well, if I can just pivot to you there, because Valerie gave us some of the good examples of how the World Bank and where the World Bank is, is, is using Irish funding to support different activities. And then insurance products sounds absolutely phenomenal. Within the trust fund, the ADB trust fund and, and the Irish trust fund, well, do you mind giving us an example of perhaps where some of that capital has been deployed, please, and for what? Yes, yeah, sure, Mike. Um, and just, just to let um, your, the audience know, so um, Ireland established in 2019 a trust fund for building climate and disaster resilience in small island developing states within the ADB. So this is a single party partner trust fund and it aims to help to increase resilience of the small island developing states to disasters that are caused by hazards to the impacts of change. So ADB context, this covers 16 small island developing states, so mainly in the Pacific, but also the Maldives. Uh, the total contribution for this five year period is 12 million euros. Um, and uh, I'll give you a couple of the examples that, that we've worked with. So uh, Tonga's capital uh, island is Tonga Tapu. You will have seen it on the news in January with the really large volcano that erupted and uh, the, the consequential tsunamis that impacted the island. So it's the capital city is very low lying, but there are large areas of the island that are also at over 60 meters. So as a result of a request to deal with drainage in some of the lowest part of the island, uh, we set to undertake a multi-hazard disaster and climate risk assessment for the whole of the island so that this would allow us to identify areas that are particularly at risk to um, high impact storms with surges, but also obviously the, the sea level rise. So with uh, the support of um, the Ireland Trust Fund, uh, we conducted a very in-depth analysis, looked at a whole range of scenarios um, across a whole set of hazards. Um, and with that, we are now using that um, analysis to help inform uh, Tonga's spatial planning process. And so, um, you know, we see this as a way to start informing where are the areas that you need to pull back from investment, uh, where are the areas that you can concentrate investments that will be much wiser, much more resilient in the long term. We're seeing already some of the government ministries make decisions about where their new um, buildings will be built, um, the, where the headquarters for the disaster uh, management agency is positioned. Uh, but just even immediately after the volcano in January, we were able to provide the most up-to-date um, asset assessment to the, the volcanologists working out of New Zealand and, and to start to 
um, assess the losses. So um, you know that that's that's a that's an immediate um, a benefit to the government of Tonga. Um, Ireland's support to that also though allows us to use that learning and to apply similar approaches to multi-hazard uh, climate and disaster risk assessments to help inform investments in other countries. So I think that that's a really um, uh, important example of the kind of funding. Just a couple of other areas that might be of interest. Uh, Valerie already mentioned using index insurance. Uh, we're working on a similar product, but for coral reef insurance in, in um, a number of the countries, including Fiji and Vanuatu, um, and, and basically trying to figure out how that can become a sustainable uh, recurrent policy uh, for coastal communities. And then since you've mentioned COP, one of the events which we will be co-hosting um, in the second week of COP, and which Ireland is also a supporter of, is the coalition of um, atoll nations for climate change. So the, the four governments of um, the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, and the, the Maldives have a, a, a group led by ministers uh, to try to you know, come to terms with what will be the catastrophic implications for them as nations and how they can plan to cope for that. Um, a, you know, starting immediately. So those those are and and from uh, on behalf of ADB, we're we're very grateful to this uh, support from the Irish government. So back to you, Mike. Thanks, Noel. So I think you know, Paul. I'm I'm just conscious we're just out of time, and uh, you know, one of the key things why I love doing climate finance because it's a very privileged position to hear all these stories and to sit back and listen. And you know, to think that Ireland is supporting the development of insurance products for fishermen. Uh, in terms of they can't go to work, so they maintain their livelihood. To think about what we were all watching on telly in January about this volcano and actually some funding that the Irish government had provided, as Nolan very well articulated there, was actually able to support some of the efforts that went on. Um, it's just actually mind-blowing when one thinks about it. Uh, and it makes me very proud to be Irish. But I know it's only just the tip of the iceberg in what we're doing. And we're, we're very fortunate to be hearing it today, but our colleagues obviously in Irish aid and elsewhere Obviously, doing a lot, Paul, and then your co yourself and colleagues in Department of Foreign or Finance. And now we're looking at up to a billion over the next number of years uh, in support of climate finance. So we can really potentially take these lessons here and, as some of the guys said, scale them. And then, Mike, as you said, it's the, the opportunity piece as well that we can't forget. I really liked what Valerie was saying there, you know, in terms of the blue economy in Ireland as a, a, uh, the power of demonstration. Again, another great statement, and how she brought together development, climate, and nature. And perhaps that's the way we need to start looking at this, this opportunity uh, through the lens of Irish competitiveness, but we're also doing from a development perspective. So Paul, if you can just, you know, again, I, I picked on Mike earlier on, put on his shoulders, but how can we wrap this up? How, uh, what, what are the next steps? The strategy is there. Mike obviously articulated very much what the private sector could and can't mm -hmm. do. We've heard the guys talk about the importance of that public-private partnership, and Mike, you had an element to talk about that, but. In an Irish context, what do you want to see happen in the next number of months? I suppose the key thing, I mean, you see the two ladies, and hello, Valerie, and well, I met them last week in, in Washington, is we have a lot of Irish people, and in fact, friends of Ireland as well, who, who are not Irish, in the NDBs. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really important to keep up the linkages and relationships with them. So if there is opportunities for Ireland to get involved with the MDBs or involved with projects, to let us know, and we'll certainly look at it. Conversely, then, on the other side with the private sector, as Mike says, there's an awful lot of stuff being done, both from the financial side, but also renewable companies, that we're only aware when we meet them by chance or, we, or, or at a conference like this. So again, to, to keep this sort of flows of information going so that if there is actually very good examples that we can use as you know, the power of demonstration, it's a great phrase, I'm going to steal it now, and mm -hmm. use it as examples around the world to say, we have company X here working in such and such a country. And if you use that, first of all, with the country of, of origin there, but then maybe to try and sell that to the NDB, so to, you know, um, get it wider, bring it up to scale. You know, and because again, the Department of Finance or the Department of Foreign Affairs are not fully aware of, of what's happening on the ground, I think. Yeah. We just can't, we're a small country. And I think to do that, but also talk to other countries then as well to see what's working in these countries and also the best thing, what's not working? We don't make the mistakes again. I mean, a billion is a lot over, over four years, but we actually need more. And if we can actually follow from good examples, copy what they're doing and do it better, we've done it with financial services, as Mike said, in the IFSC, and just do exactly the same again. Yeah. I think, Mike, there is maybe after this, there's a, there's a discussion required about almost 
an evolved model about how we engaged with the Irish industry on, di on the green finance agenda and the sustainable finance on the climate finance agenda. And perhaps you could talk about that offline afterwards. But just, Mike, maybe final comments from yourself, please, as we wrap up. Um, well, th this session has been very thought-provoking for me, and it, I actually love this kind of public-private engagement in sessions like this because we need to understand the different perspectives and the different experiences that we're, we're, we're suggesting. My final comment, Stephen, is an old Winston Churchill comment. None of his famous quotations, but a different one, something he used right on the margins when he got briefings, action to stay. That is my motto going forward. It's all about action and doing stuff because this crisis is with us now. Noel, can I just turn to you for a final comment? I know you've got another call now, so maybe a final comment from you, Noel, please. No, I, I think from, from Ireland's perspective, I think there's a lot of scope for further engagement through the MDBs. I, I think there's a lot of scope for, for uh, Irish companies to, to learn from it. Um, I had a chat with ESBI um, recently, and obviously ADB has the energy transition uh, mechanism, which uh, is a scalable um, market-based mechanism to accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to, to clean energy. And, and I think, you know, Ireland's experience also um, in the in, uh, the energy sector internationally, uh, pro, you know, provides a lot of opportunities for engagement in this kind of area. So, so um, as uh, you know, we have the, the regular engagement with Paul and the team. So, so, so always happy to keep these conversations going on, on, on innovations within the MDBs. Thank you, Noel. Valerie, we've kind of seen your background move from darkness to light as you've been talking to us, so obviously the rest of the world in DC is kicking into life now. Your final comment, please. I think Ireland's in a perfect position, not just because of the power of demonstration, not just because of the engine of innovation that Mike was talking about, but because of the strategic importance and generosity of the finance that it's putting on the table. Ireland's already making a difference in climate finance is already pushing us to do more on adaptation and resilience, especially in those countries that are most at risk. Those are the least developed countries and they're the small island developing states. So keep pushing us to do more of the same. Brilliant, but look, we've run out of time. I've really, really enjoyed uh, our session today. So thank you to Valerie in DC, Noel in Manila. David had to uh, jump off a few minutes ago, but delighted to have the UN with us here today as well. Mike in his KPMG role and obviously Dr. Paul Ryan the Department of Finance. And thank you, Paul, for actually pushing us as well to include this within Climate Finance Week agenda. And I think, Mike, next year, should we do Climate Finance Week again, we should really try and maybe have some of the guys here in town as well with us, uh, which I think would be quite important. So look, uh, we're going to wrap up now. The next session that we have today is at 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., where we will realise an action of the Irish Sustainable Finance Roadmap, specifically Action 10, where Ireland's first national sustainable finance fintech strategy will be launched and discussed at 2.30 p.m. Thank you for the panel for joining us, and thank you for virtually joining us as well today. Goodbye. <laughs>